Hello everyone, here is Fianna from Marketing at Side Effects. And as you may or may not know, we have just released the new version of Houdini, Houdini 19. Uh, you may or may not have seen the sneak peek video to uh, show you the some of the new features in this version or the Houdini launch presentation. If you haven't uh, seen either of those, then uh, I invite you to check out the links below. But with me today are some of the artists who worked on a few of the demos that uh, are in the uh, Houdini 19 launch materials. So let's get to it. So the last time we had this guest on our show was uh, when we brought on the Sassy Snack um, uh, tutorial series that we introduced to everyone. And uh, that is done by the author Tim van Helsingen. And today uh, we have him here to discuss a few things about uh, what he has been working on uh, over the past few months. And uh, that is the, uh, it's not a Houtini. It's a yeah. We need a, to we need to we need to come up with a with a with a name. It's a it's a it's a mojito. It's a mojito, but yeah. with Houdini, and we don't know how to Mo word Boolean. Mo yeah, yeah. If someone has an idea, put it in the comments. Tim is the guy who did the multi-shot uh, effect on the new Houdini 19 Vela multi solver. First off, I'm just really happy that I was actually able to work on this because it was something I was hope, hoping side effects would do at some point to like have some fluid stuff inside of Vellum. So it was really cool to to work on a demo uh, for that, um, and just really nice to have some just some position based fluids now instead of just flip because it just makes uh, like just small scale stuff like surface tension and like tendrils and stuff just just a lot just a lot easier. Um, so yeah, just, it was, uh, it was a, it was an interesting experience because, um, uh, it's not particular, like it's not faster than flip or something. Cause I think some people might think that it's faster than flip, but it's just, it's different and it gives some other, uh, like it gives a lot of extra sort of functionality that you wouldn't have before. Like the sort of swirling shot and filling up the glass. That's something that would have been really difficult to do before. Um, and the shot with the uh, droplet hitting the leaf, like I've, I've done, uh, droplets hitting stuff before. I even have a talk about, about that. I did, I did for you guys as well, um, where I used flip <laughs> and, and the problem with flip is that like, it's, it's like, it starts shrinking sometimes like you have to receding going on. It's like, it's not, it's not ideal. Um, so it was, uh, overall it was like a really pretty chill experience working with the new solver. There's some stuff that I like to see maybe later um for example well, what like, are those uh well for example now it's like as as it's right now it's good enough to just do basic fluids um but for example if you're like if you want something to be like really sticky like or right now you only have like uh friction uh and you can of course make stuff sticky by creating some constraints yourself, like for example, on, a, on an object it would be nice later if there's some stuff where like it automatically does stuff like that in order to create like really sticky fluids and stuff like that. Cause now it's mostly just friction, not like sticky as in like it sticks to something and then stretches like gum or something like that. Yeah, uh, like yeah exactly. I mean, you can make that by just like creating constraints yourself in the solver, but like something like that will be nice later if there's controls for that. But um, like overall, like it's just really nice as a sort of first uh, first iteration and people, I guess, can start building with this and then come up with ideas. And then I guess later can also keep evolving uh, within the solver itself. Um, you, yeah. also, you also mm -hmm. worked with... Uh, um, USD for the first time, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it was what it was. It was a better experience than I thought before going in. So that was. Um, you heard it, it guys. It, I didn't make him yeah, say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's true. Like it's still like it. It took some getting used to. But like my first experience just trying it was when it first came out, and then everything kept breaking, and I was like, okay, I'm not gonna touch this until it's more more ready. Uh, but right now it was like like really usable like i got the whole thing rendered in in karma 
uh, yeah. and Solaris with with without much previous experience with it, uh, and it got done done in time for the for the teaser. So I mean that's a <laughs> that's a that's a success. Um, so yeah, and it's 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 like uh, it's 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 a lot more usable now, and uh, it did take some time to get um, to get my render times down by just some tweaking. But I, I like I have more info like on that in the talk as well. Um, but it it was overall it was a it was a it was a good experience and I'm 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 definitely gonna try it like do more stuff in it from now on because I can also see that this is gonna be I guess the future that we're heading into and um, yeah like aside from some weird quirks that I ran into maybe sometimes it it was a it was a pretty good experience and um, I'm surprised how good I got it to look with a render engine that I normally never use uh, so mm. it was a uh, was pretty pretty happy with that. So, um, yeah, pretty, pretty good experience overall. And do you want to tell us, uh, about the Sassy Snag part two? Yeah. Uh, um, like some ETA. Yeah. uh, well, ETA, I'm not going to do ETAs cause it's probably, <laughs> okay. uh, like, it's got, wait, don't commit. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's going to be a s second Sassy Snacks. Uh, so Sassy Snacks, the first one was of course the concept that we're going to make a commercial from scratch. So we started off with, uh, just a storyboard and then we did it all the way up to the final, final video. This is going to be very similar. Uh, so we're going to start with just storyboard animatic, um, and then we're going to do it all the way in the final part. And of course the, the, the big difference here is aside from it also using the Vellum solver, of course, we're also going to be using Solaris now instead of in the first session next, we're rendering everything in OBJ context and. Uh, the thing there was that a lot, like some people didn't seem to like the, that was rendered in Redshift. So it was one of the big reasons why we're also using Karma now. So everybody can just use it uh, without having to use a demo of other software. Uh, and we're going to render that all in Solera. So that's going to be a nice sort of, I guess, um, for people wanting to learn a new Vellum solver and people wanting to maybe start using Solaris in production. I guess it's going to be a good primer for uh, yeah. for both of those things. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be, going to be pretty exciting. Um, and yeah, no ETA, but sometime later this year. So at some point, is, 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 yeah, ex, at, at some point later this year, depending yes. on things. <laughs> no, no, not depending. Okay. <laughs> well, um, this year. No, no, I mean, I mean, when it's going to be out, it's going to be depending on things, but la definitely later this year. So yes. be excited. <laughs> so. Uh, so for those of you who haven't seen the, uh, uh, the shot itself, uh, Tim gave a presentation uh, about this project, um, both at The View and on our YouTube channel. So um, those should all be available for everyone to uh, view. Uh, once once you're watching this. So uh, if you haven't seen it, just uh, check out the links below. So thank you very much, Tim. And Yo. until next time. Until next time. Peace. My next guest is Bishoy Khalifa, who is the artist behind the uh, Vellum Grains demo that you may or may not have seen in the Houdini uh, 19 sneak peek or the launch presentation. Uh, welcome, Bishoy. Thanks, Fiana. Thanks for uh, getting the Kha uh, and Khalifa correctly. Uh, I so, made the uh, Vellum Greens statue uh, rise up uh, thing for uh, Houdini 19 trailer. So, like, I wanted people to know what is your experience uh, being in the beta program, um, working through the Houdini dev cycle and using pre-release Houdini. What was your experience? Well, it was actually uh, quite surprising for me because I, um, I guess the beta versions were gonna like uh, crash and have bugs all the time. Surprisingly, it didn't crash once until now. It hasn't crashed once, and um, I've made. Uh, a bunch of different projects on Houdini 19 and, and it's it's very stable. It's actually more stable than 18.5, which is, was already uh, very stable. Uh, so that was surprising. The biggest surprise was the Vellum solver, was the um, upgrade 
because the time difference in the uh, shot that I made for the trailer between 18.5 and 19, it, it was amazing. 18.5, the same simulation that took like uh, four hours and 30 minutes, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, it took like one hour and 50 minutes in Houdini 19 without changing any of the settings. So it's just um, copying and pasting the same setup from 18.5 to 19 and watch the three hour or four hour difference. That was mind blowing. I, I, I did expect some upgrades, I, but I didn't expect that level of uh, upgrades that really, the, the level that hits you that, yeah, it's, it's a new release. It's this, cool. this is like, yeah, almost a completely different solver. It's, it's the same UI, it's the same settings, it's the same everything apart from the spatial sorting and fluid uh, settings which are new. But uh, the underhood stuff, uh, the OpenCL search, that's you know three hour difference in a in a simulation could be a lifesaver if you're working production settings with tight deadlines, and or if you're a freelancer who is not um, and you don't have you know with the latest uh, computer graphics card or GPU CPU etc. It it now opens. Uh, opens the road to uh, more, you know, uh, more iterations and machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can you can do more with less uh, specs. So, so actually, that's, can you, that's very cool. Uh, can you actually tell us like what uh, configuration you were running this simulation on this project? Yeah, well, I don't have the um, highest of uh, of generations of, uh, of technology, but uh, I do have like 128 uh, gigabytes of RAM. I do have an RTX 2070 Super, which is not bad, not, you know, the 30 series, but, but not bad. And actually- You have a uh, graphics card. That's pretty good in this time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they have like a, a dual processor. Like I have two, two processors which are Intel Xeon processors, which has, which are like a standard workstation processor with 56 uh, logical processor. So 28 cores. So not, not a bad rig, but not the, uh, not the best rig. Houdini can always use more, especially uh, RAM, you know, uh, yes. but yeah, watching, watching That's Vellum, cool. watching Vellum, uh, get uh these kinds of upgrades uh that was that was amazing that was the most uh remarkable thing uh for me in hoodie 19 so good job <laughs> you you, you really Lade, outdone yourself jeff Lade and uh, jeff Lade and john lynch are uh, somewhere smiling in the distance yeah <laughs> yeah they they deserve to smile too <laughs> um so like, what else do you want to say about the, the Houdini 19 release? Did you get a chance to look at anything else or um, any sort of things that you were wishing for or hoping at some point well, in the, the biggest, future? The biggest thing that I haven't um, gotten around to playing with yet is Karma. This, it, it, it looks fantastic from the Houdini 19 trailer. It, it really, um, I guess we're going to let mantra go soon at, at this rate uh that karma is uh rising up especially with the xpu coming soon i'm i'm i can't wait for the karma xpu stuff uh so yeah that's that's what i'm uh looking forward to the most is uh playing with karma and then again playing with karma when it's uh xpu officially not not just the alpha or beta stages yeah yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, the 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 one thing that I uh, was wishing for before Houdini nineteen came out was like to make Vellum an actual multi physics uh, solver. So, and that's exactly what happened. So, yeah, yeah, an actual multi physics solver. It's it's just one solver with all the things that you can dream of. Uh, so yeah, that that's exactly what I got. So I'm very happy. Uh let me well let me first uh like direct people to your presentation about this uh, project uh there is um Bishoy's walkthrough about the uh 
vellum grain setup and uh, also there's a hip file to download as well so uh, the links are below and uh, you can grab the the hip file from the content library um, is there anything else you want to like share with the community about anything in general like like what you're up to these days or just well i'm actually say bye. Uh, doing <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually doing some more R&D with uh, Vellum, uh, with, with, you know, cloth wires, uh, Vellum grains. Maybe maybe I'm going to incorporate fluids, but uh, at this stage, I'm not, I, I haven't done yet, done that yet. So, and it's it's exciting to see uh, how it holds up uh, different, you know, physical uh, properties and materials and stuff. So that's what I'm working on right now, just pushing Vellum to the limit uh, with some R&Ds that are going to be dropping soon. And that's it, pretty boring, but, pretty boring, but uh, you know, that's what, that's what I'm doing now. Uh, I don't think it's boring, but uh, well, thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts and uh, also your hip file <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, your opinion about the, the release because... Uh, while we we update the software like we never really know you know the the real value for for artists like who are using it day to day like how how much or how well it it does improve your your day to day work so that's always uh, good to know like it's good to hear uh, yeah you knocked it out of the park uh, with this one yeah <laughs> so my next guest is Miguel, who is the artist behind the Large Atomic Blast, and he's here to tell us about um, what is his thoughts about the updates in Houdini 19. So, uh, Miguel, welcome. Thank you. So this is not your uh, first time on the uh, beta program for uh, Houdini and uh, participating in the dev cycle. Uh, this time around, uh, you were again working on the Pyro updates, uh, in particular the uh, Shockwave tool. So tell us uh, what is your thoughts about it? Yeah, so I guess, I mean, from the last uh, release to Nano 19, apart from the fact that the Pyro solver you know, shuffle a little bit its UI, uh, which is nice. Uh, the yeah, the update to the to the sourcing uh, to make shockwaves, I think, was quite nice because you know, as an FX artist, we've all had to make some shockwaves before, and it was a bit messy because everybody did its own thing. So you know, all these new ways of uh, controlling sources uh, in vanilla Houdini are great to standardize those setups, and uh, I mean the the nuclear explosion scene that I had to do, it was basically a way to, you know, use this shockwave thing in as many places as, as possible. Um, and it made it a lot easier than if I had to do it all from scratch. Uh, so in that sense, you know, anything that you guys give to the artist that, you know, make quicker things, it's, it's only going to be better. So I was quite happy about it. Uh, and you also had to work with, uh, your your simulation in LOPS. So yeah. did you ever work in uh, USD before? Yeah, so I mean, so happens that in the project I'm working on now at my company, uh, Megalis, uh, we've been using Solaris in production for more than a year now. We have a 2000 shot uh, project. Uh, we were not using Karma because at the time it was in beta yet, uh, but I was familiar with, uh, with Solaris. And, uh, you know, as an FX artist used to rendering everything in Mantra, now that Karma is a new norm, uh, it was great to be able to explore how to render effects in Karma. Um, even if you're not part of the USD pipeline where everything else is USD, just as a pure, okay, I'm doing this with Karma. And uh, it, was, it was really easy. I think it works really nice with volumes. Um, so yeah, it was a great chance to, to do it. Um, is there any sort of, uh, wish list or like, I don't know, I guess, like, uh, well, uh, for effects, I think this release 
it, it was nice. I uh, had many you know, Vellum things, I uh, had some Pyro things, but I guess uh, I, I really want to see what's next uh, with Flip. So hopefully Houdini 20, wow, 20, we'll, we'll have some surprises, uh, I'm hoping. We shall see. Yeah, uh, well, so <clears throat> so for those of you who haven't seen Miguel's work uh, on the Houdini 19 release, uh, you can catch his presentation that was played at both View and also on our YouTube channel. Uh, the link should be below. So thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, until next time. Thanks. Pleasure. So next we have uh, Joshua Rizzo, who is currently uh, still a student at Breda University, and uh, he is here to tell us about his work on the Fire Tornado demo in Houdini 19. So welcome, Josh. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. So tell tell the community how, how it was like uh, working as a remote, I mean, like everyone's working remote. <laughs> um, <laughs> How was like uh, working uh, with everyone actually that that you did uh, internally well, at Side Effects? Well, for me it was a pretty new experience because I have not worked um, that much in the industry before, not to that scale at least, and also not with people from um, other countries and other time zones as, at least. And it has been really nice and very welcoming and onboarding as well. And over the course of the project, I learned quite much. And it also was the first time I had a supervisor and a mentor and that um, I was not used to that. And it actually helped me quite a lot getting in the right direction, not getting stuck with uh, things in the project. And yeah, overall, it was a super good learning opportunity. Uh, that is good to hear. Uh, but, you know, as we, you and I know, um, it did not go like exactly smoothly, the, the things that we had uh, planned for the demo itself, the fire tornado. So uh, tell us how, how that uh, started. And then, I mean, obviously we saw the end result, but uh, tell us about the process. So we, uh, we started kind of like with um, some concept sketches and some overpaints to, to get an idea what the shot uh, would look like. And um, when I did some overpaints, um, I, I put in like some references for, for different cloud layers in there as well. And um, over the course of the project, we noticed that a lot of these elements make it, uh, make it more complicated and it was a bit, um, and I overscoped it a bit at the start. So for example, the clouds are not in there anymore because they proved to be quite difficult to do. And for the volume deform, uh, which we are, which the project was to be presented about is that we, we downscoped it a bit as well because we found a much nicer solution to work with the volume deform actually, which um, gave us a lot more uh, iteration value and we could uh, get to a, a point quicker as well with the animation. And yeah, in the end, I think the result is pretty stunning and uh, shows also like what you can do with the volume deform as well. And uh, just for context, like uh, as a like for people to know that Josh was also still like doing full-time school and uh, working with us as well. So uh, managing like project complexity and uh, like achieving the, you know, the bar that, that you have in mind is kind of a fine balance. And we kind of have that comp like uh, that opportunity to do that while we are working on the release stuff. So we are free to change um, the complexity of projects as, as we like or as we need to. So I think that that freedom uh, helps a lot. Um, Definitely. So what else? Uh, Josh did a presentation for this uh, fire tornado that is available for watching um, if you would like to find out more about it. And I believe there's also a seam file for download uh, so now that you're done with Houdini 19 stuff, uh, what are you up to these days? 
Well, um, I'm currently in my graduation year at Breda University. And uh, as part of my graduation year, we need to do a work placement. That's why I'm working currently as a junior FX artist at Access uh, Studios. And when looking back at the project, um, it was super helpful as well, because now I got, um, I got into the industry and uh, learned, learned a lot about like how to work in pipelines, how to work with a supervisor. And I think this was a really good introduction into the industry. All right, everyone. So uh, Josh going to be free agent uh, at some point next year. <laughs> so uh, check, check out uh, his, his work uh, if you are looking for some extra hands on deck for FX. So thank you very much, Josh. And uh, bye for now. Thanks a lot for having me. Here with me is Richard, who is the author of the new PolySlice, or I should say newly included into SideFX Labs, uh, is the PolySlice tool. So welcome, Richard. Hi there. Hi. You're the guy behind uh, the PolySlice and also Network Walk. There's the small but I think important information um, that we are now introducing the inclusion of external contribution to labs. Uh, so you're the very first one. Um, tell, us, tell us a bit about the, the process and actually what, what got you started with uh, making the PolySlice. Uh, well, I kind of, I'm like, I run a department at the moment, so I can be a little bit hands off, you know, I'm managing clients and bidding quite a lot. So I kind of try to take these kind of projects that are going to push me creatively and technically. And so the police size came about, I knew there's a bit of a window to try and make some geometry very, very quickly and very fast. Um, like VEX is a really powerful tool that you can kind of do things at kind of almost like C++ speeds. Uh, like you'd have to develop in C++ as a plugin for other applications. So there was an op opportunity to tr try and make a really fast kind of operator that would just slice geometry up. So I just, yeah, that's kind of, it was just the, 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 it was like a kind of thought exercise as well as actually just the opportunity to try and do it and also trying to do it in such a way that I thought it might up, uh, open up certain possibilities, you know, to like geometry detail and stuff using, making things like um, procedural models of some kind, you know, that, that was the kind of heart of it. Uh... Do you have any advice for, for, you know, other Houdini artists that want to uh, contribute in the same way to uh, side effects labs? Yeah, I, I guess like the, well, the way I approach it is like these projects are kind of like learning exercises and um, sometimes you get something useful for yourself. And if you're very, you know, if you, and sometimes you get something useful for other people as well. So. I am quite active on Twitter and, and LinkedIn and stuff, and I kind of post things on there and I test out ideas and get feedback. So if someone's interested in maybe doing this, it's like, you know, try and start, you know, your own kind of like a line of inquiry and see if it develops into something that's good. And I think with SideFX Labs, the tool was quite mature already. And I knew there was a, a kind of like a, a mark, like there was a kind of desire for something like that because of the responses. And so it just naturally led to, you know, just kind of adding SideFX Labs on Twitter and, you know, it's, everything's so visible now, you know, if you have like some interest in what you're doing, then you don't always necessarily even have to approach like these things are kind of quite visible through Twitter. So, um, yeah, I guess just try and start your own lines of investigation, try and grow and make that useful in itself. You know, so you have value out of that. And if something comes about, then um, great. I think it's very hard from the outset to kind of say, oh, this, I want to make a tool that's going to be inside of Labs because that will never work. You know, it's best just to go on your learning journey and try and try and try and get as much value out and kind of like give something to the community. And then it may fit inside the kind of that kind of ecosystem. It could be a great tool. It's just not the right thing and sits along, won't, might not actually kind of fit well. Like I have loads of ideas, but most just kind of end up as random bits of vex or just things that end in a memory leak. <laughs> like a very, very small portion are actually useful to other people. Um, <clears throat> so then, aside from uh, the PolySlice and Network Walk, um, have you had a chance to take a look at uh, like Houdini 19 as a as a whole? Like, what kind of um, updates are most interesting for you? 
I think like, I'm super excited about uh, the new uh, CFX workflow and how that kind of integrates in KinFX. Um, I think working at scale and at volume and efficiently, those two aspects working together is like super exciting. There's so much stuff that's, you know, you've had to go for other applications and the fact that there's real progress in those areas to kind of bring, to really kind of recompete with those other DCCs um, is super exciting. And the other side is just the maturation of the, um, of, of LOPS really and leveraging the SOP, SOP libraries into like really creating some great artist workflows like layout workflows, environment workflows uh, to rival really specialized tools. Um, so obviously Houdini is quite a general kind of all-purpose software and to kind of compete with tools like Katana and their workflows and stuff that are super specific. That's exciting for me as someone who runs a department because um, it means you can have quite a small skill set and actually cover a lot of tasks, you know, and that's, I think that's certainly in where I'm working right now and the kind of departments I'm trying to build is, is kind of like I want artists that can work across multiple tasks rather than just a super stratified lane. Um, I think like Houdini 19 is a step along kind of achieving that. So are you guys uh, actually like um, for your project so far, like have you guys been using USD? We're just like pivoting that right USD. now. So we're test yeah, we're just trying to, we're just kind of like putting frameworks in place. And I think we're starting to use USD in parts of our pipeline. Um, like uh, well, I've been working with HDAs as a wrapper to kind of like move things around. And so there's a lot of analogy in terms of like this kind of nesting of data and kind of inheritance, which I've used for HDA. So it's a natural st step to into more of kind of like software agnostic world in USD. So that's where we're at. Um, I think we're a few, I think we're at a few months away from running a U USD project, probably like in a major part of the pipeline. Um, right now it's kind of wrappers for Olympic archive, Al Olympic Olympics and stuff like that. And using it as a quite a yeah, not necessarily USD premises at the moment, but more like as a wrapper for Olympic archives to communicate layouts between DCCs and that kind of thing. But it's happening, for sure. Yeah, cool. Um, any, like, uh, actually, before I go there, uh, just in case anybody uh, wants to get the example files or, or see, actually, how to use PolySlice, uh, see it in action, um, there is a presentation by Richard uh, showing this and also some uh, downloadable files um, that will be available soonish, if not already. Yeah. Uh, well, I've got once Houdini 19 is released, uh, so it probably is now. By the time people are hearing this, they'll be it'll be up yes. on my website, and that goes through all, all my um, view slash Hive talk, like so city generation uh, setups and some spaceship setups, greebling stuff, and some organic setups. Um, yeah, that'll be available on uh, richardcthomas.com and yeah, check that out because that's where my main source goes. That's where I put my articles, industry articles on and other like development tools. I'm really excited about some of the things I'm working on right now. Um, so yeah, just check that out. Maybe subscribe. Um, any, any, uh, like final parting thoughts about, uh, this latest Houdini release? CFX is going to be awesome. I'm <laughs> super excited. Like I, I'm really, I'm really super excited about the CFX because, like, I think people have been using uh, like these kind of tools themselves in house, um, but to kind of make that into a more general set, like, and the kind of solver agnostic aspect of it is like something I've been trying to push for a long time. So yeah, it's great. It's like just what I had in my head, but my, but my pipeline team or my R and D team don't have to do it anymore. It's kind of hopefully. <laughs> kind of there. So that's good. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you too. Thanks. So my next guest is Adam, uh, Adam Swab, who is the uh, artist behind the, um, well, how do I describe that? It's, it's way more sexy and uh, like beautiful than describing like a bunch of balls, boxes, and fluids <laughs> flashing against each other. Um, so I'll let you describe that shot. But uh, everyone, welcome, uh, warm welcome to Adam. Oh, thank you. I, I mean, I, I guess I would describe it as uh, beautiful fluff. 
you know, it's it's <laughs> stuff that's showing off some of the cool new things in Houdini 19, particularly the initial ask there was show off vellum fluids. And then as you and I got talking, I was saying, well, we should probably try to render this in Karma, right? And then we said, well, yeah, let's try to render it in Karma. And then all of a sudden this XPU thing popped up as like, you know, we should test XPU. And then we went and tested XPU and started to push that, even though that that wasn't the initial ask. And it was, I think, turning out to be the most exciting part as part of that journey there. So yeah, it ended up being being much more of an XPU engagement than uh, the the vellum fluids, although they're they're both in there too. It's it, you know, that's what it ended up being. So it's it's a fun little project that was meant to push both both of those things and see what the state of them is in the Houdini 19. Yeah, I was, uh, without even getting into the rendering side uh, yet, I wanted to ask what was your most exciting, um, like, exciting item in the Houdini 19 release? And I think it's fair to say that it's the XPU because while you were pretty there. calmly describing that there, like <laughs> it was it was a different reaction when when you got some renders going. So yeah, so I mean, I, there are two things you want me to talk about that now about what what the most yeah, exciting sure. part. Okay, well, I'll say the mm -hmm. second most exciting thing, which is the new curve tool for me, which is something that has been greatly needed for a long time, and I mean. Once I first got to play with that, it was still early in beta, and there were plenty of problems and plenty of you know things that were needing to be updated. But the first play was like, yes, yes, you finally are doing it. It's great, and I think that that has gotten so much attention and love. Um, people are going to absolutely love playing with that, and they're going to love that. I know it's it's one of my favorite new tools. There's a lot of great things, obviously, right? I'm. I'm not, I can't talk about every every possible thing that's in there, but just for the things that will influence my workflow the most, I think that's a great one. And then XPU was a thing that I wasn't even expecting to be in there. And then when I tried it, I couldn't believe how fast it was and how much of a game changer it is going to be for actually rendering natively in Houdini without having to go through another render engine. Um, you know obviously still a bit early and still a bit of a, a tech preview, but um, it's mm -hmm. very encouraging, very exciting. And I could see that right now, you know, it's going to handle for like a, a user like me, who's not doing massive film production stuff. It's going to handle probably 80% of what I need to do with it just right now in its current state. So when it's finished, wow. it's going to be absolutely beautiful and amazing. For everyone who who's not going to read the docs, uh, maybe you can just let them know uh, what things are still outstanding. That is that twenty percent. Yeah. So I'll or say what I know. <laughs> and again, the development and pace has been so fast. But with the developers, you know, with adding things in and fixing features and adding new things, I don't oh, I know, know what the what is going to be there for nineteen release. But for me, what was missing subsurface scattering wasn't wasn't working yet for XPU and uh, there's no motion blur on volumes. That was part of what was there. I think there might still be a couple issues going on with normal maps, just like little small things like that. But if what you're doing is, you know, typical hard surface rendering, I think it's going to work pretty well. Um, trying to think if there was anything else that was really, really out there. Um, I don't know, I have to play a bit more with it. Like the last time I used it, there weren't even gradient ramps for XPU for uh, Material X. And I saw recently on the it development is. forum that that's added and that's in there now. So yeah. like I said, a lot has changed and this is just over the last few weeks that these things have been added. So I think there's going to be plenty of features missing when H19 is actually released to the public. And then as the, the new versions new builds start rolling out, you'll see more and more features. And I don't want to speak for the developers, but it seems like that's the plan. Um, yeah, I, I also don't want to speak for developers, so we'll just mutually nod. Um, uh, so going back to your curve comment, I mean, it's the year 2021. So uh, kind of, on one hand, uh, kind of scary that it, like 
only now we have the the rewrite for the curve tool but on the other hand like yeah it's uh sounds like it's a great addition to your day-to-day -day work um and also pretty cool to hear and I, when I say pretty cool to hear, I mean like uh, R&D will be like really happy to hear that uh, for somebody who is uh, like your caliber of Houdini artist can say that like, yeah, I can do about 80% of my work with uh, Karma XPU is kind of uh, shocking, like like good to hear. Yeah, and, and again, it depends on the kind of work that you're doing because I, I talk to plenty of people that are doing you know, film level visual effects. When I say film level, I mean like, you know, actually working on Marvel films. And this isn't gonna handle what they need for Marvel films, but neither would Redshift, right? So there, there's a difference between what you're gonna be able to do, I think with certain levels of rendering. But one thing that's super cool about XPU is that you do have the ability to switch between CPU and the XPU version if you're using Material X or using the compatible shaders and you can leverage that power. So you can say, you know, my GPU isn't gonna handle this thing, let's switch to CPU mode. And all of a sudden, you know, the whole world opens up to you and, and the goal seems to be to get those looks totally consistent so that when you do switch, there's like, you know, minor variations in the look. So I, I again, it's really exciting technology and, and hopefully it's gonna be able to be used by everybody, but yes, for my needs, I think it's going to be really good. Cool. Um, there was something else I was going to ask you about, but uh, I'm kind of blanking out. Um, <laughs> yeah, hold on. Uh, papa. Sorry, I'm having a complete and utter, utter brain fart. Oh, yes, I, now I know. Cue, uh, so, cue Jeopardy theme song. Dun, dun, yes. Dun, dun. Um, so this is not your first time uh, working in USD and LOPS, uh, because obviously using Karma means you have to, you have to go to LOPS. Uh, yeah. But what's your, what's your uh, opinion on it? Like, you know, this is, this is not your first time using USD, right? It's not my first time. Um, the place where I currently work for my, my day gig, uh, we are mostly a USD pipeline. We're trying to be. So we're getting our feet wet and we have these weekly USD training sessions, which are very good. They're led by somebody at our team who really understands what they're doing. I don't know if I should give a shout out to them or not. Uh, should Up I? to you. That, yeah. that would be Ben Skin Ben Skinner and Matt Estella. Both of them know what they're doing. And um, they're really good at, at helping to guide artists with that stuff. So it's been, USD in general has been very confusing for me. It's been very confusing for a lot of artists. And I'm not going to pin this on the feet of side effects. It's something that the entire industry is trying to figure out because it's presented as some tools, but not with any sort of standardization about how you organize your scenes, how you arrange things, how you deal with all the, the various USD schemas. And most of it's built around people who have a, a big pipeline that supports that kind of stuff. So for smaller artists and smaller teams, we're kind of like, well, how does this work for me? And how yeah. can I just use this simply? And that's been the big struggle, at least with 18.5, apart from, you know, We'll, we'll be honest, there were a lot of bugs and crashes and things that weren't quite working that well with LOPS. Uh, 19 saw a huge increase in stability and, you know, a lot of crashes and things that had been going on were just, they, they weren't there anymore in 19. It became much more stable and side effects has made a big improvement in helping to help artists organize pipelines there. When I say pipelines, I mean just assetizing, understanding how to bring an asset in and assign the materials and, and put it all together. So there are some tools in there that help. I think we still have a way to go to get the average user understanding it because it still feels so foreign. Um, I, mean, I mean, I could go on and talk about this a lot because this is a, a big point of conversation with a lot of artists that use 
Houdini and are new to LOPS and new to USD in general is like how to make it all work together. Um, yep. So yeah, we're, we're still kind of working that out. There's still things that, you know, I get my heads have to scratch my head around with the various schemas because, you know, you can bring things in in many different ways and you have to author USD correctly if you want the files to be saved out and choose how that's going to work in various pipelines. Are you passing stuff down the line? Is it just for you to render out on your own? Um, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. But what is exciting about USD in general and what I've seen is I've, I've been doing a little bit of testing with USD and other software like Omniverse. It's been mm -hmm. really interesting to author USD in Houdini, assign the materials, do all the look dev and stuff like that, send a, a USD with a flattened stage out to Omniverse, just load it up and click render. And, you know, it renders with all the materials assigned and stuff like that. And that's, again, that's one of the powers of USD is that it, it does put all those things together. Um, and so I think that's really cool. Um, but yeah, it's it's gotten a bit easier, I'd say. Oh yeah, the other thing that, that we were talking about is because it's it's in Houdini, a lot of people think of LOPS slash Solaris slash USD as Houdini. And I think that the the mindset that has helped a lot is to think of it almost like another application that is buried inside Houdini. And yeah. even though you, you do have a way of interchanging between SOPs and Houdini, it's it's almost better if you just think of LOPS as its own USD. Self-contained, like, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so once you once you kind of break that idea and think like, okay, I'm not going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. What I should be doing is just authoring USD and thinking about this as here's my USD stage. I'm bringing my stuff in. It should be USD native as much as possible for the best performance. And that helps a lot. But it takes a, it takes a while to get there, I think. Uh, agreed. Uh, so... Yeah, I want to do the call out to your uh, presentation for people who want to know about uh, XPU and watch in real time, uh, like how how fast everything is and how responsive it is. For people who are totally foreign to USD and LOPS, uh, they can certainly watch you in action in real time, um, you know, navigating in LOPS and uh, using the XPU render and uh, seeing how responsive actually it is. Uh, yeah. and, and also they, they will uh, be able to get uh, scene files from your Vellum example that uh, you prepared. Um, so I highly recommend if you're curious about this uh, to check out Adam's presentation. And um, any, any parting last thoughts about uh, H19? You know, I've never been disappointed with a Houdini release. You, are one of the software manufacturers out there and developers that every single release, and I, I'm not just saying this as lip service, I mean, it's it's amazing how much great stuff gets packed into everyone. And this is just another one that has so many great new features. I'm, I'm just so thrilled and happy to, uh, to have gotten a chance to play with Houdini 19. And I know once people get it in their hands and they start working with it, they're gonna absolutely love it as well. Cool. Well, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us, Adam, and uh, wish you a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.